and welcome to another episode of House of Decline. Today, we have a follow-up episode because there was a previous episode uh, where I had on uh, today's wonderful guest. We discussed body horror uh, and something has changed <laughs> that has a- affected my ability, that my analysis of the body horror genre. And that guest we have back on today, uh, Shannon Strucci, everyone. Shannon Strucci, how are you, Shannon? I'm doing great. I'm excited Hell to be yeah. back. I'm excited to have you here. I'm excited to talk about body horror. Now that I am unbound, now that <laughs> I am free, you know, and can talk about, because um, last time you can hear it on that episode, you you specifically mentioned gender on that episode as like a big thing that trans people are upset. Body horror is like a big thing for trans people for obvious re- seemingly obvious reasons. And you mentioned that on that episode and you can hear me get flustered and try and change the subject immediately, <laughs> which is, uh, but now um, I would like to do more to explore that, to talk about, you know, uh, our relationship with gender and uh, how, you know, the bone cracking genre of body horror affects that. So, you know, mm-hmm. um, I was wondering if you could talk a little about your, you know, come into terms with your non-binary identity and, you know, um, how body horror maybe reflected that in your life, you know, just as a primer. Uh, I think a, a good example is like uh, cr- the brood. Yeah, yeah. I remember, I've always had this like terrible disgust and fear towards pregnancy and kind of towards children. Um, <laughs> mostly, I just thought, like I love my friends' kids and stuff. I love them, but I just like I I um last year I got sterilized too, which is a whole thing. Oh damn! Uh, especially if you're AFAB, because um, I was like I just can't. I just had so much like fear and just like nightmares about it. Um, and it was part of like not wanting like it, it's more about like a, a a quote like a woman's place in society like you're if you're AFAB, you're expected to like yeah grow up get married and then pop out babies yeah the biopolitic like, nature yeah yeah it's even in, in like some weird people in the socialist movement are like we shouldn't be anti children like they're are, but they're kind of like pushing I don't know the, a yeah. lot of it was the whole pregnancy thing um. I'm, I'm, but I'm pretty fortunate in that, like, any kind of dysphoria for me is more about, like, super overt femininity. Like, any time I had to be in a dress, oh, yeah. I would feel, I would have problems and feel, like, really disgusted or, like, wear makeup or um, just, be, like, the, the the more the role, I think, than anything necessarily uh, mm-hmm. physical uh, as far as gender. Like, I don't know if I'll ever, like, take hormones or get surgery or anything. It's more, and I, I mean, I'm lucky, too, that I'm at, an age now where people, at least the people I hang out with, are more respectful of that. Oh yeah. Versus all the people who'd be like, "Can't we give you a makeover? Can't you do this? Why don't you wear a dress?" It was like constant oh. with friends as, as well as like older family members, and it's like, "Can you just fucking let me live my life?" And I feel disgusted when I have to uh, present that way, unless yeah. it's like for a character or something. But yeah, it was more. But I do have like body horror stuff for me was also more like I had a tumor. I probably talked about that last episode. I yeah, yeah. When I was a kid and like psoriasis, and I have like I've had to have three different scalp surgeries for like weird stuff. Oy. Um, it's, but like luckily it's nothing like super serious. But I think yeah, it was almost a, a, a comfort of of this genre where people are disgusted by the same. Th- it, it was like it's not socially acceptable to be disgusted by pregnancy. Or like, yeah. or like periods or ovulation or any of that stuff. You're supposed to embrace it as a woman or whatever. And I'm mm-hmm. like, I'm not. I don't want that. It's gross. <laughs> Why do I have to have this? Yeah, Why yeah. do I have to pretend that it's nice to have this like disgusting thing I never wanted in me? And it was part of it. If I could give it to someone else, I would. Uh, it was. I think that like, yeah. Yeah, but, no. I mean, that's. I mean, disgust. If you're, if you want disgust with pregnancy, Cronenberg's your guy. You know, I, I remember too. watching The Fly way too young and seeing Gina Davis give birth to a maggot, and that was like, oh, this will affect me for years. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I think there is that thing to of like, um, for 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 me, yeah, social role is so important. You know, that's mm-hmm. like just the psychological aspect of of gender. You know, is really important in attuning yourself because. It's like, like just turning the girl switch in my head from, you know, going from, uh, going from this, you know, I still talk like this. I've been doing the vocal training. I've been practicing it a little and, you know, it's, it's coming along a little bit. Um, and I can do the voice a little, it's hard, it's hard to get, it takes, it's like flexing a muscle still though. Uh, mm-hmm. I'll get it one day. We'll get it natural. That one sounds day. good. Thank you. Um, but yeah, even just letting her out, you know, just like, um, it felt like more of a sense of control and agency. And it felt like 
And, you know, it's weird because you're wondering if you like, am I reinforcing some sort of feminine stereotype because I fit more like a traditionally feminine social role and I feel more comfortable conforming to that. And you play around with that question, but at the end of the day, you're just like, fuck it. I do what feels good. Fuck it. I do what I do what I want. I do what feels good. If this is like reinforcing feminine, like negative toxic femininity or whatever, you know, I don't care. I want to be little, I want to be a little elven healer. I want to be a live little <laughs> elven healer, you know, and you know, stuff you can't admit um, to yourself because it's fucking gay. You know, you're fucking, you know, what are you fucking fat? You know, I'm not going to, yeah. You know. Um, yeah, so much of that, uh, just reinforce, especially if you have a body, if you have like a type of body that you're not, that you're not supposed to embody that archetype. If you have this type of body, the biopolitic of it all, you are shaped, your meat is, is molded in a certain way. So then everything around you is affected by that as well. And so there becomes this desire to brutalize the meat into some sort of, you know, acceptable format. Um, which is why you have this obsession with like bone cracking transformation sequences, you know, why I always love like American werewolf in London and stuff mm. like that. Um, and there was like, uh, you know, there's, I feel there is like a, there's a rift between werewolf trans and vampire. As long as we're making Blanchard dichotomies, there's like vampire mm. trans and werewolf trans, <laughs> which, which side are you on? Are you vampire trans or werewolf trans? You know, Probably vampire. Oh, you're vampire trans? Probably. Ah. What, what, how would you like define it um, more, further than just like vibes? I would say that vampire trans is sort of, um, it's more, uh, I'd say werewolf trans is more solipsistic, where vampire trans is more relational. Vampire trans is all about your thrall on people, whereas uh, werewolf trans is all about, you know, focusing on your, your own meat and your own, there's a very like, uh, inner world self to it, you know, very osmosis Jones aspect to being werewolf trans, you know, which is these, obviously this is made up and stupid. I'm not, I'm not no, serious about this, you know, but I hear a lot of, cause I hear, you know, uh, 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 philosophy to Abby Thorne's making, making it a, 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 a vampire movie. And she talks a lot about, uh, uh, contra points just made her fucking big, big, long twilight video about that was a good video. too. I like that video. It was an enjoyable video. Um, and so, but I think about it because when I think about it, definitely werewolf, absolutely 100%, you know, like bone, uh, there was, have you ever seen the show Cyber Six? I am familiar. I know what, yeah, I know where you're going with it. Okay. So that was, that appeared on, yeah, Canadian, it's a big thing for uh, Canadian trans. Look, something about Canadian television it was this just state funded like trans stuff being pumped into my head from day one, <laughs> you know, for a lot of, for a lot of us, uh, Toronto girls, um, Dave Foley and drag is like a big shibboleth, you know, it's like, I saw Dave Foley and drag and I was like, huh, this is easier than I thought. You know, you can do this if you, if you really want to, you know, and mm -hmm. you know, that lays dormant for, but also other stuff like, um, like that, uh, thing that I just mentioned. <laughs> Oh my God. Um, yeah. Canadian state media. It's uh what a trip, but yeah. I mean, what were your early, like, did you have any like early childhood inklings? Like what was your first? Cause I remember like experiencing body horror way too young. We talked about it last episode, how like the nineties were like a treasure trove of people falling into vats and like, going, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, and like, did you have any, like, what, do you have any like early childhood sense memories of like a body horror sequence you saw like way too young that was tied into your thoughts about like the biopolitic or like the traumatic nature of being like forced pregnancy or something like that? I have to think on that. I, I probably read too many short horror stories really young. <laughs> I, had, I had this compilation my mom gave me um and it looked like a bible so in middle school people thought i was reading a bible which was weird <laughs> uh, but it was like classic horror stories and i remember there were just like uh there was one called green thumb about someone who was like really good in the garden this old lady but she accidentally like cut part of her finger off and like a doppelganger grew and killed her or th there were a bunch of there was one uh that's a good the one i really like called the horror at chilton castle that I always wondered if Chilton and Hannibal stuff was named after this mm -hmm. or like this guy knows his family has a terrible secret. Um, and the secret is there's like this insane, this like scary monster that lives in the basement of a castle 
that he'll come into power with the family and get a bunch of money, but when he dies, she eats him. Hmm. And just sort of like, this is sort of, it's hard to articulate the relation, but like the sense of um, helplessness or like inevitability or like being consumed or something probably Hmm. played into that. I'm sure I saw some weird stuff in like Courage the Cowardly Dog or uh, other spooky cartoons. But I think it's also, it's hard for me to articulate because like I said, I had so many um, physical problems that were not related to gender. Right. But I yeah. think that's, that's where more where it went. I mean, it's, it's all combined too, you know, cause yeah. I have, you know, mental health problems. I'm, I'm Jewish. So I'm very stomachy. You know, I have a lot of mm-hmm. the Jewish hypochondria in there, which is all this, um, you know, this obsession with hospitals. I, I get why the, the guy that created house you know, the, uh, is he's a fellow Toronto Jew. Uh, the guy that created house and then the good doctor, which unfortunately has been canceled. But, um, that's what I remembered what I was, I was going to say about cyber six. There was an episode with like a lady werewolf in it. And she was like, mm. what I liked about her was that she was sort of ugly. You know, she had this sort of like long face. She wasn't, you know, like anime ooh werewolf. There was this scary aspect to her. She had a very like wolf, like, and not like a, a nice furry face like that. And they deepened her voice so that when she was in werewolf form, she just, you know, and it had that thing about, and there was that, and that sort of, that's a very common thing with uh, trans women too, is like an obsession with monster girls. Cause it's like, oh, you're like, there's, you're a woman, but there's something wrong with you. You know, there's something animalistic or monstrous about you. So, um, in a way you sort of understand that very young as well. Like as you see your body going all fun house mirror on you when you hit puberty and, you know, either you come to terms with your identity or you sublimate it for years until it's, uh, some weird stuff happens, but even O'Malley's yelling at you. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about today. There's, uh, because, uh, ter- talk about body horror and gender, a new pretty, I would consider like epochal or will become inevitably part of like the queer canon of not just the queer canon of movies, but the canon of horror movies in general is, yeah. uh, I saw the TV glow. We saw, I saw the TV glow. <laughs> we did. Yeah. Uh, not together as we are in different geographical locations, but, uh, Individually, I I had an interesting reaction to it. Uh, I first had a sense of revulsion to it. There was like a sense of like, this is too on the nose or like, this is too, you know, there was this, there is this very overt quality about the messaging in it. Um, and also the music in it is not to my taste. Not that I like, I don't think the music is bad, but it's just like, I don't go for that, like shoegazy Alex G sort of stuff. I like, you know, like, uh, music with a lot of notes in it, like, uh, free jazz <laughs> or like, uh, you know, rockabilly. Like, I like it a yeah, me more. too. Yeah. So, um, it, the music was sort of antithetical to my taste. So it was, um, uh, but the music like is very, so there was that sense of, but as I sat with it more, I was like, nah, it's a, it's a fucking masterpiece. Fuck Jane Sean Bruin. They made a masterpiece. Fuck. You know, what am I going to do? Um, what, how did you react to it? Your, your initial thoughts on it? I really liked it. Um, yeah. like it's so stupid. It's one thing I was thinking about as I watched it, I'm like two in my own head watching stuff is it's so stupid how people will sit there and like post a screenshot of Avengers and be like, this cinematography is amazing. Yeah. Or like this gay Disney, they like argue forever about like one gay dis- or trans or whatever. <laughs> character. You yeah. know what I, mean? I saw the new Paper Mario, uh, the the remake of it mm-hmm. for Switch. Yeah. So it had really low reviews on um, Amazon. And I was like, why is that? And I clicked on it and it was just people being mad that a character is evidently trans. Oh, Vivian. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The Vivian, yeah Vivian got canonically trans and uh, Which... yeah, people are mad. At... Even, yeah, even though she was canonically trans in the Japanese version and then they changed it to the American. That's a whole, that's a whole different episode. We'll, we'll have a Vivian yeah. episode eventually. <laughs> it's a, a good excuse for me to replay the game. But yeah. it's like these people getting so like, whether they're being like shitty and transphobic or whether they're trying to seek good representation, it's like they... Mm-hmm are focusing on the, like, I love thousand year door, but these like small things of much bigger properties versus something like that. Like uh, I saw the TV glow, which is like gorgeous. It's like oh, the yeah. VFX are stunning. And it's like a deeply original, deeply like artistic avant-garde, interesting exploration yeah. of gender. It's like, please just give money to this instead of caring yeah. if there's like a trans person in star. That's how I look at it. Yeah. Like on visuals I'm, I'm alone, 
It's yeah. a fucking 10 out of 10. I don't know. I, I took note of the DP. Some guy called Kevin Yue, I think his name is. And because it was like, wow, knocked it out. of Because it delivered exactly what I wanted from movies. It's like, the thing is, everything looks like Russo Brothers' gray pap, right? Even like, you know, it's just all saturated, just earth tones. Or I, saturated color. Give me saturated color. Saturated color, please. And this movie delivers on that just a lot. You know, there's a lot of just... Uh, great magic hour shots like so many great uh blues so many great tons of like scrolling panning shots with these amazingly like eve klein blue skies like on visuals and like presentation and also because it had a limited budget i think it was like under 7.5 mil or whatever so uh a lot of the story had to be told through like pretty limited setup and a lot of camera movement and a lot of like uh slow set pieces like uh like making the most out of sort of, and, and the movie looks high grade too. It's not to say it's a cheap looking movie at all. It looks mm -hmm. fucking, you know, a chef's kiss, you know? Uh, but, um, yeah, it, it just, I, I remember there's a sequence and there's a big monologue. I guess we'll get into spoilers. We're going to get into spoilers for I saw the I think TV you have cluster. to. Yeah, we have to, I mean, it's not even like a movie where there's a huge mystery or anything like that. It's not like that. It's, it's like you have to sit through it and experiencing it. So I uh, like mm -hmm. even spoiling the plot doesn't seem that material to me, but um, yeah, there's this big uh, monologue sequence in it where Maddie, one of the characters is talking about how, uh, you know, she goes on this journey. Um, and I wondered, you know, in a different movie, they would have showed that. You know, they would have, yeah. you know, they would have actually filmed that, but because this movie can't do it on a budget, it has to rely. And so the way they do that is by telling, but by telling in such a dynamic way against like a backdrop of like a constellation with like a lot of like really interesting camera movement that it becomes mm -hmm. just as good as the showing, you know? And then you get a chance for, I forget that actress's name, but you, she, this is a real acting movie. She's real. She's really acting in it, you know? Yeah, everybody in it. Yeah. Let me look it up so I don't miss any names. Yeah, I should, I, I should uh, check her check her name but yeah that character is great everyone does a great performance job justice smith of course everyone's talking about justice smith's and it's funny because you know also one of the the things that it doesn't really bother me about the movie or just about any movie where like hollywood actors are called upon to play a, a misfits it's always funny that i have to suspend my disbelief that these comically beautiful people are like, are <laughs> like and and to no to their credit too they do a great job at playing weird or like uh uh you know sort of off-putting or strange because they're uh isolation they're they're neurodivergent because it's also not just a trans it's very like neurodivergent the the character of justice Smith's character is very autistic coded as is man i was thinking oh yeah it's autistic to autistic communication like a lot of the movie where they're like talking about the tv show or they're like whether yeah. it was like good good rep of being neurodivergent without that kind of corny like what well, like self-labeling or being really overt about it or like yeah. expository about it it's just like the way they communicate with each other I also I had just seen the Dungeons and Dragon movie, yeah, with Justice Smith, yeah. which has like to me much more like uh, some of the effects in it are, are great, and then some of it just looks like weird and cheap, or it's like flat green screen. And yeah. to go right from that to something that's so beautifully shot on a much smaller budget, it was like yeah, yeah. they kind of knew what they were doing, working within their means a lot better. Yeah, they had a freaking shot list for this movie. That's for <laughs> sure. They needed they needed one of those. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so many great visual homages. Obviously, like the movie draws upon like this Nickelodeon '90s style color palette because it's all about nostalgia. But within that color palette, it manages to reference like other color palette, like saturated color palettes from movies as well. Like there's a famous shot of uh, that's making the rounds of the ice cream truck in the movie lit with like green and pink. But I think you know I don't know if it's an intention reference to Paris, Texas or not, but it looks like a Paris, Texas shot. And it almost like, you know, just beyond like the, the queer stuff, I see this movie as like a uh, really good marker of what film should look like going forward and how we create like a new filmic language going, shoot it on fucking film, saturate the color, Let's let's do more of these, please. Let's let's let the, uh, you know, I would like more of these, please. Uh, it reminded so, me of, no. uh, what is it? Punch Drunk Love. Yeah. The interstitials. And the, it reminded me of, uh, uh, unfortunately, Upstream Color. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Up yeah he, awful person. guy. Good movie. Uh, yeah. D terrible guy. But that movie is pretty good. It also, did you watch Ghost Rider as a kid? 
Ghost was... Ghost Writer? The yeah. yeah, I did watch a ton of Ghost Writer. Remind me of the gooey Gus creature? Yes. The it freak did, I was like, yeah. is the ice cream man a, in that a reference to this gooey Gus monster? That's like oh, if yeah. you, anyone Googles it. Because that's all I kept thinking of was the gooey Gus thing that terrified me as a little kid. Although oh, looking yeah. at it now, it's still scary. <laughs> no, no it, they really did a good job making a scary thing. A freaking, yeah, I mean, TV Glow references all of that language of, like, 90s Canadian produced horror, children's horror, like uh, mm-hmm. uh, Are You Afraid of the Dark and yeah. uh, Goosebumps and, you know. They, they even used the freaking Buffy font for it. That's what my friend Carrie yeah. Shout out yeah. to my friend Carrie who explained that to me because I was not a Buffy person. Yeah. Um, that was cool. Yeah, Buffy is obviously a very huge influence on this movie. It's like it's about a Buffy-like show. Um, that and uh, Jane Schoenbrunn, I think, has said something to the effect of they were they were high, directly influenced by that, and they've been on Buffy forums. And the Buffy forums too were an inspiration. The fact that people like lose themselves in these in these tropes to try and explain something that is unattainable, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, that's like the that's the thing that sort of the movie gets at is like if you are trans or you have the problem if you have the gender problem as as we do <laughs> as or there's something about it where you are in some sort of you're being foisted uh, some social role is being foisted on you that you don't fit in it's being foisted on you because of what you look like because of your body or something like that um then but you have no reference for how to escape it you know because you don't know what non-binary is you don't know what trans is as i i had no idea what trans is growing up or like what it was is like you only did it if you were some sort of sex freak or whatever like um and it wasn't like it wasn't like a thing that was normalized or non-sexual there was only this like weird perverted element to it that's what i was taught um or, you know, you're taught that, um, like in the movie, you have the Fred Durst character through patriarchal violence. If you have like a boy body, you know, it's like, it, that's a girl show and it? you can't, can't like that stuff. You know, <laughs> what a great casting. What amazing casting. Yeah. Um, um I, I should, I, the one example I should have mentioned initially, I was a little bit older and a lot, this is one of those things too, that might be worth talking about is like, it's different for everybody and some things that some like non-cis people might find offensive other people might latch on to mm-hmm. and appreciate yes I was, I was probably like 19 when i played persona 4 for the first time i don't know if you played it <laughs> no i never That's played it. persona 4 no uh, is it cool if i spoil like one of the big spoil but spoil, i don't care about spoilers spoil it yeah there's like a, a male air quotes male detective in it named Nalto, and um like there's another character who's like conflicted over his sexuality he's like i really like this boy am i gay or whatever but you go into Naoto's dungeon and she, it's more like she feels like to be taken seriously at all. She has to pretend to be a man oh, or she's yeah. like really confused about that. And like the final boss in it, it's like um, a mad scientist doing experiments on her on like a medical exam table. Oh, and it's her being, so a lot of people were like really upset that she actually wasn't, that she wasn't like a full on trans man or whatever, but it's like, can't there be something interesting or something valuable in her feeling so like shoehorned into that position. And with uh, Kanji, the boy who has a crush on her too, he just has like his dungeon is like a gay bathhouse because he's so scared that he's gay or he doesn't understand that like he can like different kinds of people or have different hobbies. Yeah. I think that game deals with it really well with some of the body horror element too because like their bosses are like these like grotesque deformed versions of themselves because they're so scared of not being accepted. Yeah. And I understand why people reject that game because he's not actually gay and she's not actually like a, a, an explicit trans man. Yeah. It's like, that, I took a lot. That meant a lot to me. Yeah. Like starting college and trying to figure stuff out because it's like I'm not a lesbian or I'm not a trans man, but I like – those were the more socially acceptable roles to me. Mm-hmm. Like even within the the trans community, like being yeah. non-binary, people don't understand it or they like, I don't know. It's com- it's complicated. Yeah. I mean, it is. I mean, that's the yeah. thing about, you know, what we, I mean, that's what the movie is about because you don't have a reference. You have to sort of get at it indirectly through tropes from, you know, uh, especially, I mean, Anime, especially, you know, like Final Fantasy VII, just because Japan has a very different relationship with queer stuff, you're sort of allowed to get those androgynous looking, you know, characters in there and it's more socially Mm -hmm. accepted. And that becomes a lot of your primary or initial tropes about, you know, playing with gender and stuff like that, or how it's, oh, it's not so cut and dry. You can be like a femi looking man or like a masky looking woman or, you know, anything, anything else. But yeah, just not, if you don't have the language for it, you have to reach through these tropes. You have to reach through these TV tropes that sort of get at the idea 
of what you're trying to get at, which is why you form such sort of unhealthy fixative relationships on this descent into fantasy, you know, in, in other ways, it sort of reminded me this movie of like heavenly creatures or something where it's like, uh, did you ever see that one? The Peter Jackson one, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's a fully, right. It's, you know, two people that have the same psychosis that get into a fantasy together and their fantasy motivates each other, but you know, one is more reticent than the other. And that sort of creates the tension within the relationship as you know, is a lot of queer relationships. I'm sure. Did you have, did you have like a, a, a trans person in your life who was sort of, cajoling you on and you were sort of reticent to accept it at first because that would definitely happen to me which is something that happens in the movie i was it was more like internal um Mm -hmm. i don't think i would have known when i when i when i was like going through this stuff i didn't know very many trans people i knew some and i didn't know any non-binary people and it was like this is sexuality not gender but i remember i was in high school and i had this like really like bad moment where I was mm-hmm. talking to two friends, one who was a gay cis man and one who was a straight cis woman. Mm-hmm. And they were both just talking about how like bisexual people aren't real and they're doing it for attention. <laughs> oh no. Like, These are supposed to be the people who would like support me, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and they're, they're out of, cause I went to a very conservative high school. It's like, this is the best I'm gonna get. Is this just what life is? Do I just need to pretend to be something I'm not? Oh. Um, so it was more like in my own head. And, and I think it was more one becoming uh, getting a social group that was very accepting that I knew wouldn't reject me if I came out as non-binary or mm-hmm. if I asked them to use different pronouns that they would be chill with it. Mm-hmm. And also just getting so like so disgusted with myself and sick of like, if I was in, I used to do a lot of tabletop streaming and they'd be like, women only stream. And they'd invite me on. I wanted to be like, no, stop. That's mm-hmm. not, you know, people still do that though, even though I'm out. But it was more like getting so frustrated being like, I'm not that yeah. or, or feeling accepted, but. I think too, and, and, and like, and non-binary is such a weird thing that yeah. I don't know as much if people, um, if it's something people recognize and push for as much, if you're not as over versus there is the, the thing of like eggs yeah. and trans women that sometimes people can be super pushy about it. Yeah. But other times I think it's cool. I think well, people just need to be chill about it. I mean, I don't want to get, yeah, that's a whole discourse that I don't, I'm not, I'm too new to this to get into the egg uh, uh, prime directive, (laughs) which is that, that opens a whole can of worms. But um, Mm -hmm. in, I mean, in my experience, like, like when I came, after I came out, there were, you know, trans women were like, I thought you were already trans. What are you talking about? You know, (laughs) I feel like there were, there were bets about me or so, or people like already anticipated it. Um, And it was, um, And I think there is a thing that you do and that, you know, I sort of do now when I see someone with the signs, what I'll do is I won't suggest it to them, but I'll be very friendly to them and talk about my experiences openly in front of them. And that's sort of how, how I do it. You know, if I, I think that's a good way. That's like respectful of boundaries. Yeah. So, So I try to do that too. Our people will say something. It's like, obviously I figured out my stuff. I think a lot earlier, whether or not it came out about mm-hmm. it like I, I knew i was like by in high school yeah. and the non-binary thing just sort of made sense as i got more better language about it yeah uh, but having friends my own age, like i'm in my early 30s friends of my own age or older who are still figuring out it's like it's really important to be patient and respectful of boundaries but there are also oh, moments yeah. where i'm like what did you just say yeah sometimes <laughs> yeah sometimes it's so obvious like you have to you got it you know you just got it you know you're yeah. probably just trans <laughs> you know you're probably yeah, yeah. Sometimes there are, okay, I, I said I wouldn't get into egg prime directive. We launched head full on into egg prime directive. Yeah, we can cut this. Or, or a, no, no, we, no, no, we can talk about I mean, I, I feel like I take it with a grain of salt because, yeah, once I said, I, I'm very new to this. So I, I feel like these uh, well-worn, you know, discourses, I, I don't necessarily have the leverage to talk about. But, you know, I, because of the, I have, you know, some measure of, uh, uh, ability some measure of uh, uh spread on the internet when i came out um yeah a bunch of people were then like hey i'm trans your podcast you know made me realize i was trans as well, which is awesome. very gratifying yeah it was awesome that's awesome but it's also like uh i don't know what i'm doing i can't give you advice i just got here <laughs> you know it's just you know i'm flying by the seat of my pants um but 
it's also that thing where it, it's like now you feel like a great sense of you know have you ever like done the thing where you had the someone has come out to you because they find you non-threatening or whatever and the the you have to like then have the three-hour conversation with them have you have you had the opportunity to do oh, that yeah yeah I, i'm fortunate i mean like i'll tell them to whoever i'm talking to it's like i'm not a therapist or i'm not like an expert but i definitely I, especially with like actual friends i can't do it with fans <laughs> I, you know, yeah. good for them that they're figuring stuff out, but I don't want to be that to someone I don't know. But yeah, yeah. I, I feel, I feel, I'm, I feel grateful that people feel comfortable enough with me and know that I'm comfortable talking about it. I've had that multiple times of like a, you get like a 3 a.m. DM or something. Yeah. For, Cause I'm always up late and of like, Hey, is it okay if we talk about this? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Let's talk about it. However you end up with it. You don't have, there's always more time to figure it out. And yeah. Yeah, it's happened to me a few times. It's cool. I mean, I, that's a very important to me to do that because it's like so much of why I was reticent to embrace it is because I totally bought this like bullshit patriarchal right wing notion of like the raving blue hair. Like I was very scared and intimidated by trans people because I thought if I said the wrong thing, like they would kill me or like they would jump down my throat or point at my finger and go, sis. To see, you know something like that i was like i just wanted to belong and now you know the, the afraid of being singled out or whatever or for like breaking some sort of throat and then you meet trans people and you find oh no they're just chill they're just they're chill you know it's like uh there is no shrieking blue i mean there are like always histrionic people but that's like that's just people they're histrionic cis people they're histrionic you know they're not more common amongst queer people i don't know what yeah. like yeah you know, and it's more, it's always the most kind of out of touch extreme people that are the loudest. Cause I've definitely gotten some stuff online, oh, whether yeah. it's just weird or people being mad at me or mm -hmm. for things that like, I don't know, just for having opinions on that aren't really controversial opinions on gender sexuality, uh, people get really mad, but yeah. it's just like, if you, uh, but then I talk to people in real life. <laughs> and they yeah. Or whatever. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. I have more uh, trans woman friends in real life than I do non-binary friends and none of them are ever like we just talk about movies you know yeah or, yeah i mean gender is like it's an important component that you know undergirds a lot of your stuff but it's like you know it's not i burnt out on i burnt out on my own like gender autobio comics which is why i'm doing the igor comics again i was like i realized oh there's only so many and there's always like a problem too, because like especially when you're doing gag comics, there's like always the tendency to go into trans Jeff Foxworthy, you know. If, you <laughs> yeah. know, if you wear programmer socks, you just might be, you know. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, there's a tendency to do that, which I caught myself doing, and uh, you know, so, so there was a need to change direction immediately before I start becoming, you know, too tropey or into it, but. But, you know, that's a weird worry. I mean, because why should I be worried about that? Why does society make me worried about trans pandering or whatever? You know, why, why can't I just do what's in my heart? I defy you. I defy you. No, no <laughs> I don't defy anything. Uh, the movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the freaking movie. Um, yeah. So the visuals, fucking 10 out of 10. Performances, 10 out of 10. Uh, I really love how fucked up. They make justice Smith. I really love the, like the, you didn't take care of yourself. You stopped taking care of yourself. Cause you saw no point in living makeup. And it's like, Oh, get it. Get him some chapstick. Yeah. <laughs> get a, you know. And I like it because that's body horror, but it's subtle. It's just about like aging badly because you, you just don't see yourself as a person, which happened to me. That happened mm -hmm. to me. <laughs> I you posting pictures. You myself. had quite like a transformation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. It was fucked. No, it was crazy because it's like, I literally just, it, when you're in cis hell mode and you mm -hmm. just have, there's something wrong with you, but you don't know what it is. You just, you know, reach out for anything or you just don't care what you, you see no point in exercising or eating right or doing anything like that because it's like, why, who, why bother? You know, you're never going to get the thing you want. Um, so yeah, I very much relate to that. Just like if you don't end up you know, with, uh, if you don't end up with the body you want at like, a, or not just body or like your social position, or if you don't end up with the role that you want, you know, you flit in and out of existence and you can just spend 20 years not realizing how fucked up you've become, how, how fucked up things have gotten for you physically, because you can only relate to the world through these sort of psychic tropes. 
um, mm-hmm. because you know your relationship with your flesh has been robbed from you. Um, and which is eventually why the movie has that denouement where that the trope of the you know TV static and the flesh inside you know are united to. I mean that's a very interesting. We can talk about. I guess we didn't do a synopsis of the. Maybe we should do a synopsis of the movie or something like that. Uh, in order to get the audience who hasn't seen it. Uh, I presume everyone's seen it. <laughs> I think anyone, like, just the premise was enough to sell me on it. Like, we yeah. were talking after the movie, and my friend Carrie was like, "I didn't. they didn't even watch trailers or anything. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I think it's such a vibes-based movie, too. I just yeah. really knew it was a movie about being trans, and it wasn't really a horror movie, but it was a horror movie, yeah. and it was disturbing people, and it looked cool. And I said, okay. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it is about it. being trans, but it isn't just about being, you know, there is oh, yeah, a broader and about, like, theme. nostalgia yeah. and, and 90s yeah. media f- fandom and consumption. And yeah. Uh, I guess for anyone that's still stuck with the spoilers, the big premise of the movie is two, two gay kids, two queer kids get obsessed with the TV show. They sort of, uh, you know, deal with various transphobia throughout their high school years and never come to accept. One comes to accept their queer identity and tries to get the other to do it through a metaphor about being buried alive, but they both have like a relationship with the show and they think it's real. And there's like, uh, but yeah, uh, eventually just a lot of time passes and uh, their obsession with the show, you know, yields to, that's the thing. There's not much of a plot, nothing of, not a lot happens in the movie, you know, Uh, which is, it's mostly about these two characters obsession with the show, how it might be real. It might not. One character believes that they can get to the fantasy of the show by burying themselves alive, which is obviously a metaphor for the spiritual death that you have to go through in order to sort of accept your trans identity. You have to discard the old identity through this traumatic uh, process, which was very much like that for me. And it's not like I killed, like I don't like the phrase, I killed the boy inside me, because he's still there. He's just hanging out in the background or whatever. He's just, mm-hmm. you know, he's like, ha. You know, he's in the back of my head going, ha, you know. So, And uh, some people are like, I killed the boy inside me, and that's totally fine. You know, whatever, whatever mm-hmm. you gotta do in order to get yourself right, but you know, at any rate, there's always that when you're accepting it, there's that traumatic quality to it. You know, when I think of egg cracking, the the metaphor that I use is it felt like Athena erupting from Zeus's head. You know, there was this mm-hmm. tr- like there was this body horror, even to the psychological aspect of it. There was this like horrible, thinky, skull cracking, like brain pain to it, which is the movie is is very much steeped in. Yeah. I don't know. Was it like that? Was it like a painful process for you of like accepting the identity or was it like there, there was more like a snap, like what was the pain associated with it or the burying was, alive moment? <laughs> yeah, did you have a burying alive moment? I, a lot of it was more fear because I live in Georgia. Um, oh yeah. I wasn't as in tune. Well, like even when I was 20, I never wore makeup. I hated wearing dresses and skirts and stuff. I was mm-hmm. never socially, I'm not really like feminine. Like men will like hug the women I'm with and then shake my hand. That's the vibe, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's yeah. the vibe I have. I'm yeah, not yeah. like super butch, but that's still like. But when I was in high school, I had long hair, um, and I hated it. Mm-hmm. I hated like because it was all frizzed out. I didn't know how to take care of it. Yeah. Um, and like my hair texture is really different from my mom's. Yeah. So like she didn't like we would try all these different projects and or products and not really know what to do. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I would just like wear hoodies and anime shirts and I like hate, I did hate how I looked. Mm-hmm. I was very shy. I was very withdrawn. Um, yeah. I felt like there was something wrong with me and that I couldn't be out as queer. And then I wanted to cut it off in college, but I was like, it was a fear of like being hate crime. Essentially. It's like people think yeah. I'm a lesbian. People yell stuff at me, which does happen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but when I find, and I also just like, don't, I'm so avoidant of attention. I knew when I cut it off, I would get a bunch of comments from people, even if they were positive. I don't like people looking at me or you know yeah um commenting on my appearance but i was it was so cool when i did cut it off in like 2010 i was around 20 like i looked so much better and it was like well i felt happier with myself it was a more authentic expression of myself it was yeah. like letting that go it w- but it was a scary it was scary to change anything like that for me just because yeah. it was like letting go of a safety of like passing and whatever even though people misinterpret what i am to harass me yeah like i get certain stuff yelled at me that's not related to what I actually am, but it's like, well, I know that the, it's the hate in their heart regardless. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it was uh, more, and then, I, but that was pretty, so that was like 14 years ago yeah. that I was just like, I'll accept whatever people want to yell at me. Cause I'm just so sick of how I look. And I'm so sick of like, I didn't want to look at my reflection. 
yeah. in the glass. And I'm like almost vain. <laughs> oh yeah, like, absolutely. I mean? Oh yeah, I feel for so sure. Much better you know, and, like, I'm always feeling my oats and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah, and and being able to like, uh, and dealing to like, na- learning to navigate queer spaces of like being weirdly aggressively hit on by cis women who feel safe hitting on me and they would be like inappropriate with me sometimes because they know I'm not going to do anything. So it's like fun for them, which I didn't experience when I was younger. Yeah. Being uh, like, well, like, yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Um, I've done a thing. I've, I've posted a selfie or two online and, uh, I do the, I have the thing where it's like, Oh, I'm getting very sexually aggressive comments from men now, which does make me feel like a woman in the bad way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Uh, with the trans exclusive radical misogyny, uh, trans inclusive radical misogyny, I guess they call it. Um, that's People the gag. Are weird. People also, are weird. Uh, something I dealt with that was absolutely, it was just annoying is like, because I am so avoidant of posting anything like sexual on Twitter or about my own sexuality or, or relationships. Yeah. I've had multiple people like really aggressively insist I'm asexual, but like, okay. you know, I'm not, <laughs> it's also just like, I'm not, it's just like factually not it, like no one ever put queer stuff on me. Cause I was pretty out by the time I was like, had an internet following. Yeah. But it's the weird assumptions people make either. They're like making weird horny comments that are really inappropriate. Are they being like, well, Shannon is ace and blah. I'm like, I'm where did you get that? You made that up. Yeah. You know? They, yeah, they think you're, it, it's, yeah, people will just assume anything about your appearance because you have, or it's just like, do you remember the AGP girls discourse? <laughs> Someone said AGP girls. I shouldn't bring it up. I even, I can't, I shouldn't even bring up the Blanchard terms. I do the thing now where I bring up AGP versus HDS to let HSDS to a zoomer. And they're like, what's that? And it's like, no, fuck. You didn't know. I did. Fuck. I shouldn't bring it up. You know, you didn't know about it. Now I've introduced you to this horrible thing. Um, but yeah, someone, someone online made some comment about, um, AGP. <laughs> AGP is a horrible term. One that personally hurt me for a lot, like, because that's when I was 15, you know, I was like, I can't stop looking at these pictures of women uh, with a, something a little different about them. What could, what could this be? Um, and then I c- came across AGP. And then there was that sudden thing of, oh, thank God, I'm not a freak. I'm just a pervert. I can still be, you know, oh. a man and, you know, benefit from the privilege of being a man or whatever, you know? And so, but yeah, then, but of course, you know, if some, everyone, like you said, the, like with the gay people in your school, even if you're queer, you're still trying to be alpha queer or whatever. You still want to set up yeah. a hierarchy where you're better. And he so nice. he just thought all bi people were faking. <laughs> that made it worse. That made it worse, right? He, wasn't he was mean. polite about it. He was, yeah, it, he really felt it in his heart. It oh, wasn't no. like he was putting it, it was, uh, that made it hurt. And I was like, okay, I'm never huh. coming out ever. Yeah. No one needs to know I'll just marry. Yeah. But non-binary um, people get that so much. I mean, like the whole true scum thing and the whole like yeah. I'm I'm binary femme or whatever. Uh, but yeah, to me, that's like that's also like the, a very great aspect of the horror of transness that TV glow gets into you is um, so. So I was I was gay before I when I was when I thought I was cis. You know, I was a I, I was a bisexual. I only dated men though, so so functionally gay. Um, and, um, and, uh, so yeah, it, it, no one doubts you're gay. No one says you don't exist because you're yeah. gay. You know, no one says that this, you're just pretending to be gay. They, cause they can sort of like, uh, straight people can conceptually wrap their head around gay in a way they can't with trans, you know, it's like, okay, you just like the opposite thing. You know, I sort of mm-hmm. get being attracted to something so I can sort of wrap my head around this, but with trans it's, it's very different. You know, it's a very different feeling, it's very abstract, hard to articulate. You have to do it through like a series of metaphors or stories in a lot of ways. Um, very idiomatically, you have to articulate it. So, um, and the terrible thing about it is like, you can feel a certain way and you will have people that don't know anything about you. Just like saying you're asexual, just like saying that they can peer into your soul. They have somehow gained the ability to peer into the vastness of your soul and prescribe for you what you are and then say that you don't exist. So that mm-hmm. constant annihilation that you're that constant annihilation you're facing from everybody who says that they, they know what you are. Or, you know, and that's in the movie that is, of course, you know, most viscerally expressed with uh, the Fred Durst relationship. 
um, horrifying scene of like, you know, violence, patriarchal violence enacted on Justice Smith, which Lord knows I relate to, you know, in a very, in a very significant uh, way. Um, but yeah, I guess, you know, I, at the end of the movie, of course, you know, you do a 20 year time skip. He rejects Justice Smith, uh, rejects Maddie. Owen rejects Maddie's, uh, invitation to bury, get buried alive and escape into the pink opaque. Um, and, uh, so then there's just a sudden 20 year time skip. Owen says it was time to become a man. And, uh, uh, I even got a family, a family, which you never see. Which is, yes. you know, which is very funny because uh, mm-hmm. it sort of gets across how, you know, yeah, you just go through the motions when you when you accept, you know, cis hell, accept just living because you're too afraid, as Owen is, you know, he's given the opportunity many times to, yeah. like, and he's just sticking to comfort, as he says when he, uh, after that great scene of him getting the ghost glasses on his neck, you know, he goes to the house and goes like, I can't do this. I can't do it. I'm scared. I want to go back home. I want to go back home. Cause that's, that, that happened to me too. Like, can't, can't do it. Cause you're afraid what's going to happen. You're afraid all of your relationships are changed. Even the relationships you have with your shitty dad or something like that, you're afraid is going to change. And you don't, you're, you know, you still want that level of normalcy and comfort, you know? So you run away from the thing that will make you happy as well. Um, because other people tell you you don't exist and you believe them for for a while. Or the I was also scared. I had seen it happen because I was in such a conservative area that like if I again I wasn't a lesbian, but if like people's parents thought I was a lesbian, I wouldn't have been able to hang out with my female friends because then I'm dangerous. I'm like a predator. Yeah. I'm like a, yeah. and obviously it's like way more for like binary trans people that it's like that times a thousand. But that was in my head too of like I'm not gonna have the same even on the most basic level, it's like, we're the same people that we've always been. But if I'm just more honest about how I feel inside, even though I have no feelings for this person, like I didn't want mm-hmm. to date any of my little like movie nerd friends, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but their parents might've, you know, but it could have been violent towards me or, or kick me. It's like, even though I look the same, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's awful. That fear of it's persecution. Scary. Yeah. That's what holds you back a lot mm-hmm. of the time. Well, cause you also, you do get persecuted, especially like, uh, so the characters, both Maddie and Owen, are very neurodivergent coded. The movie basically implied, like one scene with Connor O'Malley says, "Can you can you look me in the eye? You know, can you look <laughs> me in the eye even once? You know, mm-hmm. um, even the way he acts with his mom, very sheltered. You know, can't accept a lot. Uh, like, and so um, if you are neurodivergent, you learn a lot to be emotionally distant." because every genuine emotion or reaction you have to something is wrong and then you get punished for it which is like i mean you've, even you see that when owen is very young at the beginning of the movie and he has like the wrong reactions to his like his mom asking stuff and sort of wanders away and feels distant or has like has to consider a lot before he says anything you know that's a uh, you know reminded reminded of me as a, as a freaking kid you know I remember uh, he like spits on the cotton candy and like watches the saliva in the cotton candy scene. Yeah. That to me was like, if it, like t- weird, like being into textures yeah. and watching stuff like that. Yeah. That's not a very neurotypical thing unless he was much younger. Yeah. Um, I mean, talk about texture. I mean, I think it's interesting how much, um, I, and this directly comes out of sort of the analog horror stuff that was on YouTube. I remember last year, uh, Skinner Rink was a big movie. I talked, I, I got the opportunity to talk to Kyle, uh, nice. over Twitter and stuff. And there's an episode of this podcast with him on it, but, um, watch that episode. Listen to that. <laughs> listen to the Skinner Rink. Um, but yeah, um, that movie is very much about texture. That movie is very much about, um, playing with texture and how just the, the shape or feeling or grain of things, affects your perception of reality and this movie too also very textural playing with the texture between specifically digital and analog uh film formats that's a very important thing throughout the movie is like owen's depersonalization or uh his uh his uh, uh relationship with his identity is reflected directly through him like fading into digital texture or like old timey tv video texture and stuff like that from the film texture of reality um 
So that's like, and I wonder what is it about texture? You know <laughs> what? And even the soundtrack, very textural type music. Like it's not very, it's not heavily melodic music. It's not very like riffy type music. And music is really important in the movie too. There's a, a Twin Peaks, the return style, uh, perf- which I'm sure that was directly influenced by Twin Peaks. I have no doubt in my mind. Somebody told me what, like an interview. Yeah. Yeah. It was mentioned. And it's great. The performances are great, but they're not like it. The music in it is interesting to me because the soundtrack is by Alex G. And because for a while I thought, you know, what scores were like classic scores, like Bernard Harriman scores or like um, John Williams scores is there's like a lot of leitmotif. There's like a lot of melody specifically, which drives uh, the emotion of a scene or something. But this music is very, this very shoegazy type music is very different. It's very ambient. Very you know, it's very, it's very cool. textural, you know, mm-hmm. as I would say, there's something about, instead of playing a, a dozen notes, you only play one for like a really long time and hear how it fades out, you know, which is, you know, how much <laughs> that sort of describes a lot of the feeling of the movie. You just have this one little bit of stimulation and you got to make it last because you have nothing else, you know? Yeah. I, I don't know if it really has anything to do with gender or like projecting onto like, I always related more to male characters than female, even though I don't don't like identify as male, but talking about like, like I watched hot fuzz at least 30 times. (laughs) One of my neurodivergent things was like, I, would rewatch like one piece episodes and certain movie even when i was a little kid it was disney movies like over and over and over again but even when i was like a teenager into my 20s of like i love this so much mm-hmm. i have to it wasn't as much emotional escapism or gender stuff i think it was like i have to study every little tiny element of this and commit it to memory mm-hmm. or whatever um so i related to that too like if i had been a little bit older i probably would have been exchanging tapes with people i did record i watched um uh, I would record Lupin overnight and then watch it uh, when I woke up in the morning too, and watch those tapes over and over and over again. Um, and Freaking Lupin! I understand the the yeah. I've been a god. I was like thirteen watching Lupin, which is I was like over twenty. That's too young ago. to watch. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Fujikamine. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> What's this me, all uh, about? Yeah, that definitely gave me brain damage. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, I, I I related to that and ha- I was so because I was very lonely as a little kid. I had some friends, but not people like like kept the, it's the movie the you're doing the movie <laughs> yeah i was shy and yeah. then it was like i was talking about when i got to high school i watched hot fuzz and got into movies and then i made like that was my first time i made a lot of friends mm-hmm. i was like oh my god and they were more mostly more accepting of me and, and like that was how we connected was like we would say, there was nothing to do i went to high school in a rural place where there was really nothing to do so we would just like rent or buy dvds and watch them together and it was cool yeah um to finally um, have like friends and share that kind of stuff with them yeah i mean that's what the movie is largely about is um and what i've talked about this element of trans identity before how when you don't have some you don't have the words to articulate what you are and you're you so you have to relate to it through like a conduit or a medium um so you never can touch emotion directly but you can touch it through like the latex glove of like a pop culture trope or something like that um, there's always this sort of mediated uh, ability, but you can get very close, which is why it's so like torturous and tantalizing. Cause you can get like 70% there to like a real emotion through a trope. But then there's like that, that missing part of it as well, which th- this sort of movie, this movie deals with as well. Oh, and almost gets there so many times, but it's through the pink pig. Yeah. Yeah. You just want to, you just want to reach into the film and be like, you just want to throw around a football, man. You know, come on, we want to talk about this, man, you know? And, um, yeah, so that, that thing of like, um, you're, you're almost that mediated thing. It reminds me in, in terms of like big trans media, it's like, it's like the matrix. Cause that movie is a Baudrillard movie and that movie is all about simulacra, right? About how we make these sort of miniature simulations for ourselves in order to reenact our lives and form our idealized selves or whatever, you know, which is, you know, forming your idealized self is a big part of the matrix movie as it is here, you know, as Owen fantasizes himself as Isabel as many of us do with pop culture characters. You know, you said you had male tropes through, through pop culture characters. Were you like, uh, was Columbo one of them? I know you're a big Columbo fan. <laughs> I like Columbo. Yeah. Um, I dressed up as Columbo for Halloween once. I, I think it was less like one-to-one and more for Halloween. I never wanted to dress as female characters. I always yeah. liked, or if I liked female characters, it was like Naoto from Persona 4. Yeah. It was like 
gender whatever or like uh nico robin from one piece who's like very uh serious and reserved and very morbid yeah and it's like it was also the problem of i'm not emotional i'm uh more like i i I sit there and i think things through logically and not again it's like misogynistic to say women aren't like yeah but but it's also like yeah yeah I, so I'm not like crying or I'm not like following a man around or it's like watching um, Pokemon. Like I didn't want to be Misty. Oh, I asked, really, right? I wanted to be Misty so bad. Yeah, and I it was could, a little yeah. different. Yeah, exactly. But it was like, yeah. I did, what I would, and it was so insulting to me what was given to like romantic comedies and stuff. There are some that I like, but with my little high school girly friends, we go see, they would go see a horror movie to appease me. And then I would go see a rom-com because that's what they wanted to watch. And I would just found it so loathsome. It's like, this yeah. is what I'm expected to be and to like and it's like awful yeah Um, so i think it was more all i had if there had been more like oh this is something i want to talk about yeah that i think contrapoints talks about in her twilight video i thought was interesting it's like a lot of uh, afab people whether like cis women or uh, cis women or lesbians or trans men write fan fiction about male characters like male and male stuff and then people will be like oh that's so misogynistic that you're not and you're fetishizing gay men it's like well we're like projecting onto like what we have right <laughs> the, good, yeah. the good characters in a show that are more interesting or whether it's some kind of gender envy thing or, or anything like that um, mm-hmm. and people call it misogynistic it's like if the world was different and we had these like beautiful interesting female characters and everything or non-binary characters maybe people would be more attached to that but for yeah. me i was like i love dale cooper i wonder if that means anything you know <laughs> <laughs> when i was in high school i love oh um, yeah yeah it's just hard to find when there's nothing good when there are no good trans characters or very few good female characters, it's like, what else am I supposed to mm-hmm. I, either? I feel completely alienated and like a space alien and like, I don't belong anywhere. Or like we were talking about you glom onto something that's like maybe 30% off, but it feels good to relate to yeah. anything at that point. Yeah. Um, I, it's very funny, like who the pop culture characters I related to, like when I was a very early child and Mm -hmm. you have no conception of gender when you're like before like six years old, it doesn't matter. Right. So you're allowed to like anything. And as many queer kids, I loved Sailor Moon. And who was my favorite character in Sailor Moon? Why Sailor Jupiter, you know, like a tall, (laughs) tough, tomboyish woman who was constantly at odds with her femininity. I wonder why I like that. You know, wonder why I like that. And it was all these, you know, and that was another thing that hold me, you know, talk about like patriarchal stuff or hold, hold, holding you back. Cause like, a lot of the time you think, oh, you can only be the one woman if you want to be a trans. You can only be like the the brat stall. You know, you can, mm-hmm. you're not a real trans woman unless you act the most feminine possible. Any vestige of male within you or any tomboyishness is instantly met with suspicion. You know, you're still a man because you like these these sort of male coded things whatever so the but eventually you realize wait there are tons of women that like boy stuff why am i am i equivalent about this this is not which is you know and it's very the archetype of the woman that i wanted to be was uh, for lack of a better term, tough chick, you know, mm-hmm. they were always like tough green women for some reason, Buttercup <laughs> and Powerpuff girls, you know, uh, rogue in the X-Men, you know, Oh, uh, uh, uh you know, a tough, you know, self-possessed lady who cannot be touched. Wonder why I was obsessed with that, you know, but it's very funny how, like when I had fully internalized that I was a boy, you know, it's like, I'm living the boy life now, how like the men that I liked were very different than the women that I identified with. The men that I identified with were like Joel Barish from Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, or especially Will Graham in Hannibal, you know, Mm. that was like sad sack guy with 17 dogs. Yeah. Sign me up. (laughs) Sad sack, tortured, morbid guy with 17 dogs. That's me. Yeah. So it's weird how like the male characters that their personalities were so much different than the, than the women characters that they were all depressed guys. Whereas the women characters that I liked were all headstrong and, you know, uh, tough and stuff like that, which is what I think is, you know, sort of interesting about, you know, that happens in this movie too, where like eventually uh, Justice Smith Owen uh, accepts male role model characters or just has the woman beaten, the desire to be Isabel beaten out of him. So he just decides to take on whatever trope uh, of manhood. It's like, which is, I guess, the only people he knows is Connor O'Malley and Fred Durst, which is... Good luck. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great Connor O'Malley jump scare in this. Uh, steals the show <laughs> in a lot I, of ways. I... Yeah. I 
I tweeted about this, but like I lost it laughing yeah. when the door opens and he's in there and like no one else in the theater laughed. And I was like, oh, I got to go uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that scene is so fucking funny. Everyone in my yeah. theater laughed. I saw it in it. See it in Try and see it in the theater with a lot of queer people because there have been reports of people like seeing this movie and like some of the scenes when like Owen is in the dress and which is a beautiful, tender, lovely scene. And people were laughing at, it. I've heard reports. That's of awful. People were, I, I did get, get to it. see it with trans people. Or, well, like I, they were queer people, visibly queer people. I shouldn't speculate on other aspects, although, you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I felt like a lot of the, the dialogue with the pink opaque that was obviously written to be kind of cheesy and funny, like Buffy esque or nineties. Mm-hmm. or Some of the jokes with that, there was a little bit of laughter, Mm-hmm. But maybe people were just, they were so in it, they didn't want to laugh. But it was yeah. one of those movies where I'm like, the part of it, this is meant to be funny. Yeah, Donald this is a movie. Is screaming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, <laughs> buddy. <laughs> whoa. Hey, buddy. Yeah, yeah. I love yeah. that because I think I had been told he was in the movie, but I forgot. And I yeah. definitely wasn't expecting that. So I thought, and his like performance is really funny. But yeah, at yeah. At that point, not as much later on. It's like very sad, you know. But like it's important say, too, in the eye and stuff. Because this is like this becomes your character who you end up basing your male. Do- like he follows him to the funland in the end because he just doesn't know where else to go. He's choosing any sort of male figure that has any sort of affection. To- and to the character's credit, you know, when Justice Smith has the freak out of the Icaro belly, he's like, "Hey, buddy, are you okay?" There is like a weird compassion that his character has in the end. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a big thing. Is the ending. Do you think it's a happy ending or a? That's what I like about it too. It's pretty ambiguous as to what you know the tone of the ending is. I interpret it very much as, and it's sort of like very much a Rorschach test for wherever you are personally in transition. You know, uh, for me who just came out, I see it as nothing but a happy ending because I see it as you know I'm a late in life trans. You know, and it, that was it, the experience was very much like that for me, where it's just I mm-hmm. sublimated it for 20 years, let my body go to shit. And then one day it just all catches up with you and you have a nervous breakdown at work, which happened to me. <laughs> and it, mm-hmm. It's like you you do something painful and drastic to yourself in order to get the stuff. And because in the scene when Owen is opening up his heart. He opens up his yonic, you know, the, the yonic <laughs> video drum wound. Yeah, the video drum, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, to see the magic was inside him all along. Um, and a credit to Justice Smith's acting, because afterwards, after that scene happens, he's going through the fun center and going, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But to me, I interpret it still as, even though he's still contrite and still apologizing for things, he has the characteristic light behind the eyes that like trans people who have made the discovery. I So to me, and for, for me, because it was so close to what happened and after I turned the girl switch, I instantly got like the light behind the eyes thing, even though I was still contrite about it and saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm like, you know, there was still that, you know, so I think to me, I interpret it as like, it's not such a downer movie because I think, you know, the conflict is over right at the Owen figures it out. Uh, and I, and you don't need to do the sequel, like the prologue where he transitions or whatever, because the conflict of the movie is over at that point. Um, but I don't know. Did you think it is a more like devastating or sad ending or something like that? I mean, I would probably need to rewatch it, but I took it as like, it was too late for owen oh there was the one opportunity that which isn't how real life works no uh with that kind of thing it's never too late but the to be buried in the football field or whatever or or him like it it was the breakdown or it was not necessarily even that but i'm sorry i'm sorry is like he has this beautiful thing in him but he's still gonna like there's nothing worth living for in his life yeah where it's just like the mr melancholy arcade and conor o'malley and all these weird people Mm -hmm. um but he's still for, for some reason out of like fear or, or um, not complacency, but like wanting safety and what he has uh, continuing to be terrified and suppressing it. Like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Cause that also matches with me with like so many people I've known who are like queer and or mm-hmm. trans of feeling so bad about it that it becomes like, they still suppress it. Yeah. Yeah. They still suppress it or they feel bad about it. Or there's like still a lot of shame. Yeah. It's not that I never struggle with that, but I'm at a point too. um, where I've kind of worked through all this stuff already yeah. for the most part, you know, and been pub- like online publicly queer and non-binary for a while uh, where I'm like, oh man, I'm, I- it made me happy um, in a selfish way of like, oh, I never went through that. Cause I came out as queer when I was like 19 Yeah, and yeah. Then more, um, I don't know sort of ambiguously gendered for a long time too like (laughs) yeah yeah uh, the way that i dress and and present myself people it's not hard for you know i did not dress to pass or whatever 
um whatever that is <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, I, I interpreted it as sad or that yeah owen's gonna keep repressing it even though there's this beautiful thing inside of him whether the moment is passed or not yeah but i think it is like you said open to interpretation yeah it's like emotionally devastating to watch him just scream yeah like, uh, it's great great perform great scene and everyone is like yeah. theatrically you know just standing still like in in a play or something like that mm -hmm. doing that uh, yeah twilight fantastic. zone episode or something yeah and, um, yeah, I think the other reason why I interpreted as happy is because like, even that was my experience, even after I turned the girl switch and come out, you know, you still can't do everything right away. You know, you don't magically yeah. turn into a girl overnight. There's still, you are understanding that there is a process, a negotiation with society before, you know, you will get there. And so that's what motivates the contriteness and the apologies, you know, but to me, it's like, I see it, you know, I, and I think because it's like, I almost, I'm still new to this. I have to see it as a happy ending. You know, I have to see it. as, And also I see it as a happy ending because recently I did an episode of, about Sinfest, the comic Sinfest with, uh, um, do you know that comic? Let me, uh, I might be familiar. Let me Google it. At any, at any, the episode, I did it with, uh, bitter Corella, uh, and uh, we both come to the uh, conclusion that the person Tatsuya Yoshida who oh. writes it is a classic rotten egg or someone that never came to terms with their um, their gender, and that sort of motivates a lot of their strange turns into like extreme right wing politics and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, like you're thinking about this a lot. Yeah, like, yeah, you really like, yeah. You're thinking, I don't like to project on people, but that is one of those instances of like I have a lot of cis have friends they don't think about this at all. Yeah. They just think about like whatever their dog or movies or whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, so, obsessed with trans women. I mean, that's also why I think Owen eventually realizes that is because he doesn't have the qualities of, you know, the classic, you know, rotten, like it didn't ruin his brain. He just mm -hmm. got really sad and quiet, which is, that's what happens when you're going through cis hell, but you're not like, you, you don't let it completely ruin you like mm -hmm. the Sinfest guy or something like that. That's so, so weird. Yeah. I've seen, I've seen yeah, I've seen those on Twitter, people talking about it on Twitter. I'm like, wow, yeah, there's something, there's a lot of stuff where you see it, where it's yeah. like, there's something going on there that's bad in your, yeah. in your brain. But yeah, to the movie's credit, like you can have any interpretation of it, which is, I think, um, that's another, and I think even in like the big, uh, the big quote from the movie, there is still time. You know, I think what's interesting about that to me is it has a double meaning is that there is still time. Of course, you can, you can transition anytime you want to, of course you can't, there's nothing mm -hmm. stopping you, right? There's like, the only thing stopping you is the stupid sense of shame that people have you've inherited from a dumb society. Right. Um, but also there is still time is also, there is the existence of something called still time, time, which moves forward, but doesn't move at all. You know, which is what happens when you're in cis hell, this feeling of like, everything is progressing really rapidly yet you're still in this stasis you know and that's that's a big theme throughout the movie is just time going eh, 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 while still you feel like you're not moving at all but you haven't noticed that your you know body has become decrepit and that you've you know just age pro so that concept of not only you still have time to capitalize on what you want but also there exists a concept of where you can just get mired in this this void that you don't notice until it's just years later. There is that still time. There is that, um, you know, uh, stasis, you know, which that movie is about, which is oh, like, it's not just textural horror, but it's like a type of time horror that I, that I haven't really seen before a type of like horror about the aging and the passage of time that is, um, you know, sort of unique to the queer experience as well that I, that the I only... love to see. The only example I could think of is the Mr. So Mr. Show sketch that I'm going to marry your stupid ass. <laughs> Where at the end, he's like, Where did time go? <laughs> like, just yeah. tell it. When they're gay, it's yeah. not really a joke about homosexuality, but it's, yeah, they marry and they have a whole life together. And then yeah. it, just, it all catches up to him at the end. Uh, although that's I mean, a happier story. I guess a queer movie about aging, which sort of deals with uh, is Death Becomes Her, is very much about that. That sort of like, uh, uh, I love that movie too, you know astonishing to me that a bunch of straight guys made the gayest movie of all time. Like, how did they do that? <laughs> you know, more so than the effects in that movie are really impressive. Like I'm a, I like Zemeckis, you know, not the weird mocap stuff, but you know, how can you not like, you know, Roger rabbit or any of that stuff, you know, it's uh, just on a technical level, like marveling at that stuff. But yeah. Um, a big, a little, little Zemeckis aside, <laughs> a little, little Bob Zemeckis aside there. I was going to say too, uh, 
well, at least I'm a big fan of it. The Venture Brothers is like oh, two yeah. cishet guys who like, although I think Doc Hammer's come out about like being autistic and like, I sure. think that influences a lot of it as well, but like they have like a billion gay people and some like mixed like trans rep, but that's like the gayish cartoon. I've ever oh yeah. Watched, well, Dr. Girlfriend is like huge for trans women. Cause you know, yeah. the Victor Ecker November line. Yes, I belong in here. I just have a deep voice, <laughs> you, know, yeah. you know, that's, so that's, that's a real thing for many of us. Yeah. She's never treated as anything less than like super hot and cool and yeah. you know, and not in like a weird dehumanizing way either. No, but even on like the specials of the DVDs, you'll have Doctor Doc Hammer dressing up as her, and you know she's yeah. still yeah, seen as sexy. And you know he pulls it off honestly. You know he looks good. He looks good as Doctor Girlfriend. And he's very very androgynous. Yeah, I think it's also that they're two little art weirdos, New York yeah. art weirdos, uh, even though they're straight guys. I have that repeatedly said that they're straight guys. Yeah, um, I mean that's always like that was like uh, the group of sisters men that i always found purchase with you know it was mm -hmm. was like art weirdos or beta men or other men that had been discarded by like alpha dudes as well but didn't really fit into that trope because you know um i mean that's what sort of like turned me up one of the big indicators that made me realize i was uh trans or like enjoyed wanted to be one of the girls or like craved sort of like more of a feminine social group that was sort of alien to me as i was a boy and had internalized uh, you can only have like was the the way that like uh like that sort of alpha bro male groups acted with each other especially if you're like neurodivergent whereas the, there's like this constant test this hazing test that they're giving you where they're saying stuff that they don't mean or saying like weirdly aggressive stuff and then they lock you like you're in fear for a second and they're like ah, just kidding man and it's like that was the trope of a lot of those groups and i couldn't handle that because i would just take everything way too literally and get really fucking scared you know and women do that less you know they have you know they tend to do that they have their own passive aggressive weirdness yeah, they have but, different things yeah but there's no undercurrent of physical violence to it which was the thing that really turned me off you know you know i could deal with the like weird like emotional stuff you know i, mm -hmm. I had a ability to do that but feeling threatened by large people was just always something that never felt good to me and that's what i encountered a lot in those classic you know male friendship groups which is was a big clue to that and you know happens this ha happens in the fucking movie you know you, scenes where you know justice smith can't relate to uh you know these men that he's supposed to be but there's also like something i couldn't handle in those groups especially as i got more like in college i became a lot more confident and comfortable mm -hmm. yeah. in part because i was expressing myself the way i wanted to be um i remember talking to this guy who was in one of my classes we were like on a school trip and he was really nice, but I remember he was drinking like a wine cooler or something or like a Mike's Hard Lemonade. <laughs> yeah. And he said something like, you know, I don't care what people think. I like these. And I was thinking, you said that because you're scared that we're like judging you for drinking a drink. Why do you care? Like, I understand that it's been beaten into you or whatever, but most yeah. of my friends will just like drink it. They're like, yeah, I like it. Yeah, just the walking on eggshells quality of the, like. The or... security of it. The like, where is someone going to hurt me? Because like it's a, the most alpha bros are the most insecure like their their masculinity will like crumble if anyone catches them wearing like a pink shirt or something yeah. ridiculous it's like it's it's i can't hand, even separate from the threats of violence even when they're more chill it's like i don't want to talk yeah. i can't talk to you it's, it's my favorite bill burr joke ever <laughs> like i i love the bill burr joke where he's talking about yeah i wanted to go into the store i wanted to buy a pumpkin cough a pumpkin for halloween and the first thing that entered my head was what are you a fag you know <laughs> what are you <laughs> and it's like is that is yeah, that burden yeah yeah it's awful, oh my God. and I, I most I have like I said, I'm friends with a lot of like street people, and they're just I, I for someone to, to get close to someone, they have for me, they have to be like I don't want to say normal, but not so insecure about every little thing, like or if they're insecure about being nerdy or or uh, a conventional, um, non conventional gender expression or any of these things. Yeah, it's all like connected in this kind of like sad insecurity. I remember too, uh, there was a young woman I knew in college who was really nice, but she was super conventionally pretty and probably mm -hmm. went on into some kind of job as like a lawyer in finance. Mm -hmm. She was embarrassed that she had a DS game that she played like Kirby because that was unfeminine or that was nerdy. And I wanted to be like, yeah, that's sad. Yeah. <laughs> just just least, wanna, like, you know? you. Yeah. Why yeah. do, why do, yeah. Why do everyone have to conform to these tropes constantly? But that's, you know, mm -hmm. that's what the freaking movie is about. You're given yeah. these rules for how to operate. You're given these really limited rules uh, for your schema and structure of society. I mean, I think that's why you descend into like the tropes of 
of pop culture as well, because those limited rules reproduce themselves in media. Like the, this is like another world with limited rules, but ones that conform closer to your standard until, you know, the real realization is, you know, uh, there are no rules, you know, you can do what you want as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. You know, that's the big realization that you eventually come just do as you want to feel no shame. Who cares if people judge you just so long as you know, you're not producing negative externalities or whatever. But I guess I that's what you like you a lot more too. Yeah. <laughs> like your friends, if you're just like happy and normal and like, yeah, not, yeah I, I'm a lot, I got a lot more popular. I was just able to communicate with people and make friends when I was like, not constantly in my own head about every single little decision. Yeah. Well, cause it was also like, um, I mean, I had a very different, it's interesting because of how many tropes in this movie that I experienced, how many trans tropes, but how, how differently I dealt with it. Cause, um, I did escape into pop culture and stuff, but a lot of my reaction to being like ostracized or like not having a trope was the, uh, what I call the Scheherazade reaction that some, uh, uh, autistic or trans people or queer people have where, uh, I once I have a friend who is an Egyptian drag queen. And one time he said, uh, you know, he was, he was calling himself Scheherazade at one point. Cause the idea is that, Oh, isn't it just a queer experience where they're trying to kill you, but if you can entertain them for a thousand nights, you know, maybe <laughs> they won't kill you. And that was yeah. my strategy is like, if you have like some sort of entertainment talent, if you're funny, if you can sing, if you can dance, you know, if I can show them my secondary talent or ability, then they will judge me better. You know, if I can, if I can provide something to them, but then, you know, there becomes this immense pressure of like having to be constantly on or else they'll kill you. And once you make the transition, you stop caring as much about constantly being on, you know, because it's like, I can just exist. You know, they like me, even if I'm not entertaining them, you know? which is, mm -hmm. that was the way that I would dealt with it, which is much different than the way that Owen deals with it. And the, you know, he doesn't become a song and dance man you know, as no. I did. Yeah. I never, like, I, like I was saying, I don't like direct attention that much, but there was with a lot of my work, my video essay work, I would get very in my own head of like, I have to make something worthwhile to rationalize me existing or yeah. anything that I've done in the past is like, I have to do. And I, luckily I don't feel that as much now, but it was like, I, pouring myself into my work. Um, and also when I did video essays, because of how I look and how I'm perceived uh, on like a lot of different levels, mm -hmm. trying to make what I was saying, like being overly neurotic about not having any loopholes, nothing people can pick apart, nothing where people will think I'm <laughs> Yeah, nothing yeah, will yeah. be like, oh, the stupid blue hair. It's, <laughs> blue, it's always so, blue hair, yeah. I've never dyed my hair either. Like, like, <laughs> this is the thing too that drove me, like, uh, one thing about being non-binary is there's no socially um like there are rules for being a man and rules for being a woman that are really, yeah. really clear whether you want to subscribe to them or not and the only thing about being non-binary is if like i got like a little undercut that was pink and a little bow tie you know what i mean yeah like, yeah, yeah. like nb kind of if i don't i would have to like wear a binder and it's great for people if they want to present that way it's like i just yeah. want to i'm just myself my winning as being myself, can you just let me live without having to be like a peacock of gender, yeah. right? I pr pretty clearly am queer yeah. <laughs> uh, by the way that I get approached on the street and stuff, but there's like weird, it's like, you can't tell me there are rules for me when there aren't even rules. Like you're making, we're, can't we just yeah. make them up as we go? I'm like making a third thing. Can it be what I want instead of again, being like the, the very stereotypical thing that I'm like, I don't want, yeah, I don't want to do that. Yeah. I, I think it, it makes me think of that Simpsons line in like the John Waters episode where Homer says, you know me, Marge, I like my homosexuals flaming, you know, <laughs> even though yeah. the gag is that John is obviously gay and Homer just hasn't picked up on it. But, um, but there is something to that where it's like, there is this expectation by non-queer people um, that, they want you to be very overt. If you're somehow like a covert queer, that is unacceptable because or then they can't pigeonhole yeah. you. Yeah. Cause you're, you're just like one of us, you're, you're sneaking in or something like that. So they want you to be more identifiably whatever, you know, which is why, you know, you get into the trope with, Oh, if you're a trans woman, you got to be like the most femi looking trans woman imaginable. You can't, you can't be like, which is, you know, or you have to be, or even that thing of where you have to be a brick, huh? You have to be, you have to be true and Jack because then people will accept you more if you're true and Jack or something like that, because you will be obviously the otherized thing, which then people mm -hmm. can ascribe their assumptions and tropes onto you. So it's, you either have to be one or the other. You can't just be something, 
you can't you can't be normal right you can never be the thing you can never be is fucking normal right uh, to other well, that's people what, i just want to be i i'm not like i'm definitely neurodivergent like diagnosed adhd i don't know if i'm autistic or not that's a whole separate thing yeah. i'm definitely like different i always and and the non-binary thing for me too uh it was more like this is what was always inside of me i never felt comfortable being like a girl or a woman yeah. um, and just finding the outside words to articulate it and maybe i'll find a better outside word in the future this is just what i have now and yeah. it's like but also i just that's not it, it, it's not my whole personality. It's not yeah. the 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 one lens with which I interact with other people. Not all like I have a yeah. ton of queer friends, but not, that's not like a prerequisite for me. I know for some people that's like a safety prerequisite, and I understand that. But yeah. It's like I have all these different hobbies and interests, and it's like it, it's so upsetting to still be otherized. And someone looks at me or just looks at like a YouTube video I did, and that's that blind looking at me and how I present and whatever blinds them to everything else, and that's all they can see, like yeah. positive or negative. It's just kind of like can't I just Want, I just want to make a video essay on a musician yeah. or whatever. And and uh, sometimes I want to talk about gender and sometimes I don't. And sometimes I want to wear, you know, more overtly queer stuff. And other times I just want to wear a t-shirt. Yeah. Why is it, you know, why am I like people have called me like femme and it's like, I wear, I don't wear anything feminine. It's just my body that you're reacting. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I'm, yeah. I, I mean, that's a, it's your fucking body, body horror. It's body horror. It's all biopolitic yeah. at the end of the day. It's cause I look as cause I have a certain type of meat you're always yeah. gonna judge me for having that certain type of meat, you know, that um, I can't escape, you know? I mean, but that's also the other thing too, is like, I, are you familiar with the phrase flesh prison that a lot of, you know, a lot of trans women or a lot of trans people use, which is, mm -hmm. I don't think I necessarily view it like that. Or for me, like I sort of took on the, if this is a flesh prison, I'm fucking Rorschach, you know, you're in yeah. here with me, I'm not in here with you, you know? Like, mm -hmm. and, and to me, it's like, I mean, it is that way because you are, you know, bound, to this universe by your body, which is why there's a lot of like Kurzweil-esque transcendentalism in, you know, uh, trans societies of like escaping into the computer, putting your personality into the computer that, you know, mm -hmm. figures in a lot where you can be something that is unmoored from meat, where you can be this sort of spiritual, digital Kierkegaardian eternal self or whatever, you know? Um, so that figures a lot, but I sort of had an opposite thing to that where it's like, no, it's like, I like the meat. And I shall brutalize it into into the form that I shall want. You know, that, uh, mm -hmm. you know. I, I don't know where I'm really going at with this, other than the fact that maybe that's what body horror meant to me. Or like, I think last episode we even discuss in Resident Evil how there's like a pleasure whenever the character injects the G virus or something, and they start feeling the power of the of the hormone or the chemical core. I, I wrote a recent comic about it, about doing HRT and sounding like a Resident Evil villain each time you do it. It's like, it is not enough to live, I must transcend. I can feel the power coursing through, you know. Um, Cause that very much, cause sort of like, there's almost becomes an empowerment through body horror as well that, you know, through this uh, visceral transformation where you turn into this monster like entity, you gain power as well and you gain confidence or you become the wolf or you become, you know, this, um, but you know, at, at the same time, it also goes against you, you know, you lose your humanity in that process, or maybe the transformation is not cathartic, but only traumatic. I mean, uh, the one thing that is very much, I relate to, uh, as a trans woman and like having being a fucking distressed by my body hair is the scene in the fly where uh, Jeff Goldblum is growing the coarse fly hairs out of his back and, and Gina Davis uh, feels them. And she's like, what are these hairs? They're so coarse. And it's like, anytime my shoulder hair is growing back, I'm like, no, I'm the fly. I am the fly. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Um, so there's that relationship, you that sort of dual relationship you might have with your body, where at one point you realize it is the conduit for the rest of everything, and there becomes a power in sort of radically and tra uh, uh, transforming it. But also, you you know, there is that thing of that radical transformation being the site of horror as well, especially like through puberty or something, or through not taking care of yourself, which is sort of the most significant. I, I find it funny that the most significant body horror uh, in this movie is just old age makeup is just like really fucked up old age makeup, uh, on justice. They really do a great job fucking them up. Oh my God. Um, yeah. uh, one time oh. I, like I come from a very Southern family and one time my uncle described someone as having hard living eyes. Like, yeah. Oh, got them hard living eyes. That's what's wrong. Like, you know, it was that kind of thing of like the sort of sad, the, the weight of years, 
on Owen and stuff. And yeah, and I think too, I when I was talking about now the hairline, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The so. chap lips. Um most of the non-binary characters are like aliens or robots or whatever. Yeah. Um, and there was something I related to in that as well, or like cyborgs like yeah. taking control over your body even if it's not socially acceptable yeah. or like accepting your body even if it's not socially acceptable like there's a point in the Naoto fight where she's like part robot and her it looks, looks like Astro Boy with her brain in it and I remember yeah. I used that as an avatar on a forum once <laughs> I was yeah. like what could that mean or like uh, Nick Valentine <laughs> in Fallout 4 I really liked <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and it's being also being like neurodivergent and being a very analytical unemotional person and sometimes projecting onto like Spock type care. I like Bones was my mm. favorite, but I'm probably the closest to Spock of the original. Oh, yeah. You know? And it's just like, and it's complicated too, because I had to make being AFAB, there are so many horrific expectations of me and my body and how I present and like every little mm. thing being scrutinized. And it's like, I'm never having to accept like, I have like my proportions, like I have really big hands for an AFAB person. I have like, yeah. I'm kind of gangly. I'm never going to be a size zero. And, and ever, and I don't care to be, and like accepting that meant accepting my body. And then it's like, oh, I have to hate my body now to fit some kind of norm. Cause I'm not like no. flat chested or I'm not like skinny androgynous the way like the, the ideal non-binary person is. It's like, I'm going to just kind of accept it and make society accept me. Yeah. Um, although that is a privilege, you know, to not get like hate crime for just having the body that I have, but it, it's complicated. And I wish people would just like, let it be complicated and let everyone have, like if I did want to go on HRT or something, but not yeah. wanting to go on it doesn't mean that I, you know, I don't know. It's, it's you're less, you're lesser than no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, well, well people, like, yeah, alpha queer people just, you know, you reproduce the patriarchal hierarchy once again, because it's like, it's not enough that you're queer. You have to be a better queer than, or a truer queer. Your queerness is directly uh, compared to the queerness of others. Yeah. Or, or maybe yeah, there's even a sense of jealousy because it's like, I have to do so much work to, you know, get where I want to go. And you, I perceive that you have to do less, which is stupid mm -hmm. because it's, I don't know, for me, the process of feminizing myself is pleasurable. It's like, well, I'm getting pleasure out of this. So like, I, it's not work. I mean, it is work in that it's, you know, like li laborious in some aspects, but it's also like, I don't know. It feels good. It doesn't seem, why would I get mad at somebody for not wanting to do that or not gaining as much pleasure as I do out of it? Or mm -hmm. I don't know. It's, it's, everyone is different and I wouldn't judge it, but I, I do ju actually, no, I deeply judge true scum. They're awful. Fuck them. You know, they're, they're you idiots. It's just, yeah. So many layers, not only like is medical transition really difficult to get to, yeah. but also it's like, can't, it's, it's like me. Like I look at asexual people, like I said, I'm not asexual. I don't mm. understand that at all. Or I don't understand being straight either, being like yeah. a queer person. I've all, th th these have always been <laughs> parts of my conceptualization of reality. So these things are very alien to me, but I just accept them. Cause like I accept whether, how other people self identify out of respect. And mm -hmm. just knowing that like my lens in which the, I view the world isn't the only way to view it. That's like fundamental too. Cause otherwise I wouldn't understand being straight or being gay. Cause I'm like, what does that mean? Yeah. Like it, I don't feel that way at all or being asexual. So it's like, why would I say someone has to, or has to not do certain things to be accepted within this? Or like, why do you even care that much yeah. when there's so much worse things going on or just like, or like things like without getting into discourse, like people use certain pronouns or identify certain ways mm -hmm. uh, that conflict with other people's conceptualization of queerness or even people who say queer is a slur. Yeah, It's like, we well, all don't have to see things the same way and that's okay. And yeah. people don't just like no out. yeah i mean people uh, people want people will just want the one thing they i mean i think that's the goal is that if you can put structure around it if you can put a series of solid concrete definitions around it then it makes it more real but that's especially the problem with trans is that it's so fucking abstract there and mm -hmm. everyone comes to it totally differently you know and it's totally contextually dependent on you know your personal life which is why you know even if you watch this tv glow movie and you recognize a bunch of stuff happened to, to you in it, it it's still like oh a bunch of stuff also didn't happen to me like owen's experience is vastly like my experience with patriarchal violence was much different because i didn't have like a dude bro dad i had like a beta dad who was sad that he mm -hmm. wasn't a dude bro which is a different type of thing you know that's like uh so um yeah and i i guess in that sense it's just like 
maybe people want there to be one thing because they want more confirmation that their, their experience is concrete or something like that. If there's only one experience, then it's like, I know I'm doing the right thing because my experience matches up to that thing. But yeah, I think, I don't know what drives a lot. I mean, what drives insecurity in general, you know? <laughs> um, it's also like, I, yeah. the, the more, like, uh, it's very Adam courtesy, but like in West, like American society in particular, putting so much focus on like individual identity mm-hmm. as like, it's more, here's this thing and I am that. So like, I am comfortable. I am safe. I have my people, but it's like, no, you're you. And the outside labels are how like you can describe yourself to people, but you don't have to hold on to it so tight that you break it or that you hurt other people or that yeah. it's so that you're marketed to, you know, or like you can find your other people to get into smaller and smaller and smaller delineations until it's like you and nobody else. I like, I think a lot about that and it's so hard because being queer is so important to me and so important to to people I know. And you feel to express yourself how you want, but it's like, if you're using that to exclude or hurt other people, or if that's like the, the only way that you could ever feel safe is like clutching a very, very like, you know, like micro label identity. Mm -hmm. Like that's not necessarily healthy. Like that, you know, I'm happy that people have that, but the human experience is so beautiful and so complicated and everybody's so different. Yeah. Um, it, and it's the same type of feel. solipsism, toxic solipsism that will drive you to isolate like Owen, you know, it yeah. will drive you to eventually something where you might find yourself 20 years down the road and find you've alienated everyone who is actually important to you or cared about you or the one person who cared about you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh my God. Uh, that, I don't know that I feel like the, the scene in the movie that got to me the most, which it might be something that's more akin to trans femme people, especially because Owen is trans femme or very heavily implied to be trans. Femme. you don't know yes. it for sure, but you know, um, but the scene where he's getting the, the ghost tattooed on his neck for the first or the ghost drawn in his neck. Cause this is the thing that a lot of closeted trans lesbians go through where there'll be a little girl have a crush on, can't approach her at all. You are madly in love with her as Owen is clearly madly in love with Maddie in this movie. Um, and, uh, but you, you can't, you know, as, as he says earlier in the movie, anytime I try and think about, you know, my feelings, you know, I get this knot in the pit of my stomach. He can't commit himself to a romantic relationship because he feels totally, and oh Lord, that happened to me. Yeah, absolutely. I can't confess any feelings to anyone I like because I just I feel like I'm a, like an awful blob shit monster. And so the scene where he just gently pulls down a shirt and you know, just does a little, little thing even mediated through the touch of the pen, but still, cause that's the thing that a lot of trans femme women will experience is like pretty girl does your makeup for the first time. And mm. it's like, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I needed this. And then so tragically, Owen, oh, because he can't take the pleasure. He can't take the shame of experiencing the pleasure from that moment. It scrubs the ghost off, you know, uh, it's so sad. So fucking sad. Uh, yeah. Great. I mean, that's the thing about the movie is that it's not really scary. I mean, it's scary and like you, you feel like a knot in the pit of your stomach after there's sort of like an existential horror to it, but it's not like there's no, there's not a huge amount of tension to it because Mm -hmm. the movie is about an absence of tension. It's about creating that sense memory of boredom and like, how do you make mundanity and boredom exciting is like a movie, a trope of the movie or like not, not excited, but how do you make it stimulating in a filmic sense? How do you like make a movie about mundanity and boredom and still make it stimulating, which Jane Schoenbrunn does expertly, you know, lots of long shots, you know, lots of, um, uh, Lynchian stuff, lots of Tarkovsky and stuff, uh, ideas that's in there in order to create that idea of slowness and still time. Uh, and really hit that emotional trope home. Yeah. So great movie, fucking great movie. Um, you know, every, everything that everyone said about it is true, you know, go see it. It's it hasn't made its budget back yet. It, it, we need to get it, get the word out for however long it's in theaters. And I think it's sort of mm-hmm. cresting on the end of its run right now. So, but uh, if it's in your town, go, please, please go see it. I, I highly recommend it. Uh, and uh, I guess I, that means we're coming to the end of the episode as I've sort of wrapped everything up. Shannon, uh, thank you so much for being on. It's always great to get your insights, uh, your videos. I've been watching them for years and, you know, you got you got your hand in everything. Uh, you got one that's coming out soon. And we're very much looking forward to that where you got one in the works. Uh, you give, give us your plugs. Give us your plugs. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Plenty of Alcoves. 
I'm on the uh, Southern Gothic body horror comedy podcast, Audio Roadshow, an actual play show. Uh, I'm on the Fight Together miniseries on the One Piece podcast. And I think I'll be back on Struggle Session soon. No. I used to be the, haven't been on in a minute, but I was the film correspondent. We're going to talk about something soon, I think, with that. Uh, and the, yeah, the video I say I'm working on is about Nick Let's Go's music and Robert Putnam's Bowling Alone and Adam Curtis and just sort of like, can art save us? I don't think so. <laughs> sad political die. i think it'll be good but it's gonna be it's like fake friends to the video essay i did that most people responded to it's gonna be a fucking downer yeah so yeah look forward to that and thank you for having me on yeah oh absolutely uh anytime anytime uh and yeah everyone should check out audi roadshow everyone should check out the strucci backlog on youtube if you haven't gone through that yet tons of good stuff in there uh and yeah um i'm sure we'll do body horror part three when uh you know i make a new discovery of queerness you know <laughs> we'll, we'll have you back uh, mm -hmm. uh probably not this this will be the end of it but well no i don't know maybe 20 years and like you said i don't uh, if you uh, if you're non-binary but you might be something you might have a different language to articulate what you are in the future and then there might mm -hmm. be a movie that that talks about that you i'll know? be like whoa finally one for me yeah one I, for me ro anime robot girl <laughs> 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 All right. Good night, everybody. House of Decline is brought to you by members of our $10 Patreon tier. These include Big Fan of Noise, Cher, Cole Froling, Constantine Bristow, Daniel Stern, Dr. Spichemin Zero, Dustin Kosky, Esty, Fiat Lux, Grant Williams, Jody Shin, Jordan Rebe, Keaton Livingston, Kevin Ott, Kimberly Latrun, Liz Heckmayer, Miles Forrester, Piscadoro, Stephen Pakelny, Tor, and Trungles. Thank you for your support, you wonderful, wonderful people.